Um, great. So today I am going to talk about building a robust data pipeline with the DAX stack, DBT, Airflow, and Great Expectations. Um, so first of all, just a few words about myself. I'm a, I just call it data person. I've done a very um, wide range of data related tasks, anything from analytics to data modeling, um, to data engineering. So lots of different things. Um, so I'm a of a multi-purpose data person and uh, currently um, consultant. I'm based in New York City. In case you can hear an accent, um, I'm from Germany originally, so that's where the accent comes from. And then traveled via uh, a few years in England to New York City. Um, I've worked for a few data-centric startups in healthcare specifically and data infrastructure in the past. So um, I went through Flatiron Health for a few years. Uh, I was at Superconductive, which is the uh, company behind Great Expectations, which I'm going to cover in this talk. And in my spare time, I like to run, bike, I podcast, um, and I also uh, volunteer with um, NYC Pi Ladies to run uh, coding workshops. So just a few words about myself. Um, as for the agenda for the structure of this talk, um, I am, first of all, this is sort of three parts. First of all, I'm going to uh, very briefly introduce the individual um, components of what I call the DAX stack. So really quick recap of DBT, Airflow, and Great Expectations. Um, then uh, I am going to talk about uh, part one of the choose your own DAC adventure, um, which is how uh, can you integrate DBT um, into Airflow? So different approaches for integrating DBT into Airflow. And uh, then in the last part, I am going to talk about sort of the choose your own DAC adventure part two, um, which is different approaches to testing with DBT and great expectations. And I'm sure a lot of people have questions around when should I test, what, how, with which tool, um, what are the pros and cons of that? So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that. All right, let's get started. So first of all, the DAG stack components. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with like just a couple of minutes of um, sort of like motivation behind that. Um, DBT is a uh, data transformation tool. And I'm sure uh, a lot of you have heard about that. Um, it allows you to write um, uh, data pipelines, data transformation pipelines using templated SQL. Um, Airflow, we already know it's a, a um, workflow orchestration tool and great expectations is a um, data validation library. So um, the reason why I chose those three components is because I think they're really, they work together really well to build a robust data pipeline. So this talk is really sort of aimed at people who might have already experimented with all those different components or maybe just with two of them and aren't quite sure how to put all these together. So I figured I'll do a little bit of a deep dive into the different patterns of how you can combine these tools. First of all, really quick recap, um, in case, like I said, in case you haven't actually uh, seen any of these um, tools yet. So first of all, um, DBT, uh, DBT stands for Data Built Tool. Um, it's all lowercase, very important. Um, DBT is quote unquote, the T in ELT. So the transformation uh, part of your ELT pipeline. And DBT lets you construct a data transformation pipeline using um, what we call templated SQL queries. So it's really just um, uh, you write a SQL query as you would in any other circumstances when you want to query your data and you can replace uh, certain parts of that query with uh, Jinja templates in order to reference other tables, for example, in order to actually implement certain macros to variable replacements, things like that. So it's pretty, pretty neat and allows you to write really nicely um, structured data pipelines instead of having like one huge uh, SQL script. Um, DBT also comes with um, a built-in runner. Um, so every time you uh, run a DBT pipeline, it basically parses out all the different SQL queries that you've written, builds a DAG, so it builds a graph from uh, those SQL queries to um, reference all the different uh, uh, dependencies, um, builds a DAG from that, and then executes all the individual queries against your database. So DBT really works against um, the data in your database, data warehouse. 
Um, so as an example, uh, the, the canonical um, example or sample project um, that DBT always uses is the Jaffo shop. And you can imagine you have a, a query to query your customers table, you have a query to query your orders table. Um, and then uh, you can uh, join, for example, join those two uh, tables together um, to, to denormalize it and you'll get the orders table out of it. And if you reference it that way, or if you build your deck that way, you'll you'll get this like nice uh, graph out of it. So DBT is super convenient um, for structuring your data transformation pipelines. So that's step one. Um, and again, I'm going really pretty fast here, I assume people have a either heard of DBT before or, um, you know, can can probably learn a lot more from all the tutorials and the amazing documentation they have. Um, cool. Uh, step two is a uh, is Apache Airflow. I am not going to talk about Airflow here because I am very, very sure um, you all know uh, Airflow pretty well, you're probably using it, or um, maybe you're curious about using it. But we all know it's a workflow orchestration tool that allows you to build DAGs, again, different type of DAG, um, where every uh, task in your, or every node in your DAG um, corresponds to a task that does a certain thing. As you know, um, Air Airflow allows different types of tasks. So you can have, for example, bash operators that um, execute bash or just shell statements. Um, you can have um, you can have Python operators, for example, that execute Python functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, you're all familiar with that. Um, and then lastly, we have a tool called Great Expectations. And I'm actually going to spend just a little more time on great expectations, mostly because I feel like um, that is sort of the the new kid on the block, maybe. Um, and it's sort of uh, it, it, it's a little bit more special purpose um, than, let's say, DBT and Airflow, for example. So Great Expectations is an open source data validation documentation tool. It's yet another um, Python library, so everything I'm talking about today is all open source Python uh, packages, which is really, really cool and really convenient. Um, and Great Expectations lets you express what you expect from your data. So again, it is for data validation. And what you do is you write uh, statements that are called expectations, such as values in this column must be between one and six. Um, and then you use those expectations to validate your data. In this case, I just, my examples, I have a bunch of uh, CSV files, for example, or a bunch of database tables here. Um, and um, I use that to validate my data. And then Great Expectations tells me whether the data actually passes or fails uh, the validation. So pretty straightforward in, in terms of sort of the, the, the concept of Great Expectations. It does come with a lot of bells and whistles, so I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into that right now. Great, um, so first of all, what is an expectation? So um, I've already mentioned that an expectation is a statement about what we expect from our data. You can sort of think of it as like a, a data assertion that can be expressed in code. So typically um, you can write an expectation as a Python method. Um, Oh, just or a, a call to a Python method that's uh, always starts with expect. And then you can say things like expect column values to be between. Um, you specify which column you want to uh, test. And then you say, uh, in this case, because we say column values between, you can give a min and a max value. Um, there is a very wide range of built-in expectations. So you can say things like um, expect column data types um, to be of certain types. For example, if you want something to be only integers or numeric types, um, you can express that uh, you want the mean of a column to be um, a certain value. Um, one other thing that you can do that I haven't given here as an example is uh, you can specify your, um, uh, it, 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 it's called the mostly parameter, um, where you can specify some amount of fuzziness. So you can say mostly uh, 0.9, for example, which means 90% of all the rows in that particular column of all the values in that column have to match that condition. So you can express a lot of different things here. Um, the um, And any expectation can be then or corresponds to a uh, human readable sort of explanation 
um, or expression of this test. So in this case, again, just going back to the example I'm already using is values in this column must be between one and six. So how do we get to those um, expectations? There's different ways of creating expectations. As I've shown in a previous slide, I can write a, um, if I know something about my data, I can just write a, um, a call to a Python function that um, adds that expectation or creates that expectation on my data. Um, the other thing I can do that's uh, built into great expectations, which is really cool, is a built-in profiler and uh, expectation suite generator, I guess. Um, so what you can do is you can take some historical data that you've had. So, you know, um, data from like the past few months or the past year, um, let's assume you get maybe monthly data deliverables and you just throw um, like the previous data set at uh, great expectations at the profiler. The profiler then looks at what it sees in the data um, and then generates expectations based on what it sees. So in this case, let's assume we have, again, um, a few tables of previous um, data deliver deliveries, um, and the profiler sees that all the values in this one column, the passenger count column, are between uh, one and six. It will generate that particular expectation to say, okay, so previously I've only seen one to six, so I'll just assume this is the range of the values in the column. Now, obviously, um, you know, just because something happens in historical data doesn't mean that's the, the truth. That's all that's allowed. So I always say um, any kind of expectation should also always be looked at by a, a human. There's always some amount of domain expertise where maybe the human says, either, oh, but we, we also allow zero or we also allow the value seven. It just hasn't occurred yet. Right. Um, or it could be the other way around where someone looks at it and says, wait, wait, wait. Actually, the maximum value that should be allowed is five. So why are we seeing sixes in here? So something's actually wrong with the historical data. If you work with data, you know that is exactly what always happens. So um, you have assumptions about your data and then you look at the real data and you realize, oops, there's actually some that that doesn't actually match uh, what I think should be true. So. I always say there should be a mix of domain expertise and and uh, and sort of like data profiling happening in order to create those expectations. So long story short, um, once you have your set of expectations, once you have your set of sort of data assertions, um, you can use those expectations, those statements, to validate your future data. So just a recap from what we've seen on the on the previous slide. Um, and then another thing, another feature that's really cool and great expectations is uh, called data docs, um, which is, well, I've heard a lot of people call them data quality reports. So somewhere between a data quality report that actually tells you, um, you know, does this, um, does the data set that I've just thrown at my expectation or the other way around, do the expectations that I've thrown at the data set, um, do these actually hold true? Do, do these pass all the tests? or not. So in this case, I'm showing an example of a failed expectation where I said, and values must be between one and six. Um, but it turns out there's actually some zero values um, in there. So data docs actually, actually tells me that. Um, and this is a really cool way to uh, communicate any kind of issues with data, for example, um, um, in your team. So these are really simple HTML, um, out HTML outputs that you can just um, host pretty much anywhere on any any web server. Um, uh, the other thing that's really cool with data docs is it basically provides a documentation of your data in terms of saying, here's the expected range. Um, if you can see this at the bottom, I have one that's, for example, says value must never be null. So it gives you a little bit of documentation um, about the, the data too. Cool. Okay, so that was sort of the three component, components of my DAX deck. So DBT, Airflow, Great Expectations with a little bit of a deep dive into Great Expectations. All right. So second part, um, AKA part one of your choose your own DAX stack adventure is um, now how do we integrate DBT and Airflow? Um, and I'm actually I'm actually curious. I, I feel like there might be two types of uh, people here in the audience. There might be folks who are already using DBT and are just like curious about some other stuff. Um, we're curious about like best practices maybe with um, uh, integrating DBT. Um, and there might be some people who haven't actually um, triggered their DBT runs with Airflow yet, or who are not even using 
uh, DBT at all and might be, for example, running Airflow DAX where each task is a SQL query, for example. So you might have a uh, data transformation pipelines, a pipeline where um, each node um, does like a, a SQL query or a SQL transformation. So whichever um, site you're coming from, um, I hope I'm, I can give you a little bit of an overview of like sort of the different approaches to integrating DBT with one definitely being the more um, prevalent one and one being slightly more experimental. So uh, let's look at that. So um, and and this is this is a lot of text. I'll I'll also be showing some some uh, some graphics in a in a second to make that a little bit um, easier to uh, to understand. So on the left hand side we have um, DBT DAC is one task in your um, Airflow DAC. So the entire DBT DAC run the entire basically DAG is um, just triggered by a single airflow task. And like I said, I'm going to show that uh, in the in the actual airflow DAG in a second. Um, this is a really straightforward approach. Um, you can use either the DBT operator, there's a DBT airflow operator, um, or you can just have a bash uh, task, um, like a bash operator that just literally just runs DBT run. Very straightforward. Um, the advantage is super simple, super easy. Um, it doesn't, you know, you don't need to do any pre-work. You just trigger DBT run and it runs. Um, on the downside, that means your DBT run is a little bit of a black box. So um, if any of your transformation um, tasks or if any of the models in your DBT DAC fails, um, that means you, like the entire dbt run task in your airflow uh DAC might fail depending on how you configure it obviously um and then you have to sort of start digging through uh the dbt logs to find out what exactly happened right um again it is a very straightforward way of doing it and i, th I think it's totally valid and totally great um on the other hand um we can have a different approach to um using uh, integrating DBT into Airflow, which means, um, which is mapping each DBT model to a single task, an individual task in your Airflow DAG. So you take um, the DBT model, so each node in your DBT DAG, um, you take that model and basically execute that particular transformation step, that particular query in an individual Airflow task. That is done by parsing out the dbt manifest. So in case you don't know what the, the uh, dbt manifest is, basically um, before, so you, you know, you write your, uh, you write your dbt models, you write your SQL queries, um, and you reference a lot of different tables. And before dbt can actually execute those queries in the right order, it needs to know what the right order is. So what DBT does is parses out um, the, the basically your entire DAG, all your models, and then creates a manifest JSON file. And the JSON file has um, a an element for each uh, for each model for each SQL query with the actual query in it, and it also says um, which nodes it depends on. So it gives you the dependency graph in a um, uh, very nicely you know formatted uh, uh, JSON. Uh, JSON file. Um, and by parsing out those SQL queries and the dependencies, you can basically reverse engineer um, the uh, DBT DAG and map that to Airflow tasks and then create the tasks. I'm actually not going to go too much into detail into how exactly this works because there is an amazing blog post on the uh, astronomer blog actually and um, I'll, I'll uh, I have the links in the in the slides and I can also post them in the um, in the slack channel later um, so so that's one way of doing it um, this is a great approach if you want very fine-grained control over all your all, all your models, over all your tasks. So, for example, um, failure of individual uh, models, you can do you can trigger individual reruns um, from the Airflow UI, um, so you don't need to uh, you know go deeper into DBT. On the other hand, it adds complexity, um, obviously, because you're like parsing out your um, your DBT DAG and then doing some mapping and like dynamically generating your Airflow DAG. Um, so it's just like a little harder to manage. 
And at the same time, it also adds a little bit of overhead um, for the parse time per model. That is mainly due to uh, dbt run doing the parsing of the dbt DAC every single time you call it. And because you call dbt run for every single um, for every single model, for every single task, that adds a little bit of an overhead. So there is a trade-off to consider, um, which is kind of the same trade-off you have pretty much anywhere when you write code, right? It's, um, you know, added complexity. Uh, fine-grained control time, um, you just have to decide sort of what, what's uh, the most important for your, um, for your particular application. So that's a lot of text and a lot of talking. I'm going to show a couple of examples here. Um, so this is really a very straightforward way of basically just uh, building an Airflow DAC. I just have a couple of dummy tasks to start and end. They're, they don't mean much. Um, I have a you know dummy note that I made for loading data. Whatever happens, you load your data into your um, into your data warehouse, your database, and then you call dbt run. So that was really just the dbt run command. I'm going to show that example in, in, uh, on the next slide. If you want to run dbt tests, I'm going to go into detail in that in the third part of this talk. Um, you can run dbt tests after dbt run, and you know you can do other things. Uh, in this case, I just have another dummy task. In code, that would look like this. Um, actually, sorry, this should be uh, this should be the um, the load data. In this case, I, I called it dbt seed. Um, it, that's the load data node. In my dummy example, I'm just using dbt seed to actually load the data. Um, dbt seed should not be used in production. I'm just using it for this example. But that is my load data step. Um, and then I have dbt run, which I'm using the bash operator for. And then I have dbt test, which is the bash operator too. And then you can see how I'm uh, chaining these together. Um, one thing to point out here, I'm using the bash operator. You could also totally import the um, dbt um, operator from the dbt airflow provider package. Um, I don't actually necessarily have a strong opinion. I'm sure I love to hear from people who have a strong opinion for that. Um, to me, the dbt operator is really just like a shortcut for um, that bash command. Uh, it, you, you can do the exact same thing with a dbt run operator. Um, so I'm just using bash operator here. Um, cool. So, so that's pretty much um, sort of like option one is just going back to this. Your dbt run is a single, um, a single task in your Airflow DAG. All right. So let's go to option two, which is uh, we're mapping each dbt model to an individual Airflow task. So like I said, we're parsing out the manifest.json and then dynamically generate um, the DAG um, each time uh, the, the um, DAG files are, are being parsed out. So again, we have just a dummy start task, um, a dummy load data, which again, my example is a dbt seed, which should not be used in production. And then I actually made a task group here. Um, that is the dbt run task group. And if you if you uh, explode that, if you um, uh, look into the the task group, you can see that each individual uh, model that we have now. So you see customers, orders, payments, blah blah blah. More customers, more orders. Um, you can see that each of those um, individual models that I have in my Jaffle shop uh, dbt project um, is mapped to an individual Airflow task. Um, and then again, like I'm running dbt tests. In this case, it's also task group and, and each test is an individual task. And I just have my dummy node. Um, so again, like the advantage of this is really if any of these individual nodes fails, I can see this in the Airflow UI. Um, I can also determine what happens uh, if an individual dbt model uh, task fails. I can say you either just continue, right, um, keep running. I can send alerts. I can do whatever I want with that. So um, it gives me a lot of um, flexibility um, to do that. On the downside, again, you have the parse step um, up front. You have the overhead of running um, the of parsing out um, e the the dbt project um, each time you call dbt run. So you call dbt run for every single one of these. Um, so this might not be very suitable for um, you know short running like a lot of short running. Um, models. If you have a bunch of like a little chunkier models that take longer to run, that overhead might be negligible. Um, 
And um, at the same time, also just a heads up, obviously, um, this is kind of reverse engineering something from the uh, dbt manifest json file so if there's any changes being made to the manifest json um, which is totally in the hands of the dbt team obviously um you know that whatever it is you're doing to parse out the manifest might just not work anymore so just just keep that in mind this is sort of a slightly experimental slightly risky approach Although, again, just going back to the blog post I mentioned, there are teams who use that kind of pattern in production, and they report that it is absolutely fantastic to have this level of fine-grained control over each dbt model directly in your Airflow UI. So again, trade-offs, I am I am not opinionated here. I think it really depends on your, on your use case and what you need. Um, but I think this is a really neat uh, alternative approach to just you know, play around with and 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 think through and see if if that is maybe an option. Um, cool. Okay. So these are the. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Um, so this is what this would look like in um, in code. Um, again, I have a you know a dummy task to start with. Um, this is again. I I forgot to rename this. So what's DBC DBTC? That is really just a load data task. Again, don't use that in production. Um, I have a dummy task uh, for the end node. And then I have my um, two run, uh, two um, task groups that I'm creating in Airflow. Um, really cool. One of my favorite, I think, newer Airflow features are task groups. It, it makes it so nice to group everything, it makes your DAX so much more uh, manageable in the UI. Um, so I create uh, two um, run groups using this uh, dbt DAC parser, like helper class that I wrote, um, where you basically just, you know, input, like uh, put in a bunch of your um, dbt kind of like details, like where's the uh, project directory, where where's my profiles um, uh, file located in, in dbt, the profiles file is used for connection details, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the parser basically returns the run group and the test group. So it returns all your um, dbt uh, models as um, uh, as Airflow tasks. And I'm just chaining these together again and, and have like a little dependency, very linear here. Um, cool, so that's what that looks like in code. There is a sample project again, um, see here and like i said i'll also post it in the um uh in the airflow summit slack later um if anyone wants to know more cool okay so that was uh part uh two so now you have kind of an idea of the different different ways of integrating dpt into your airflow DAG. um if anyone has any ideas of yet another way to do that, please do let me know. Um, I'm always always excited to like experiment with different approaches to that. Um, like I said, this is sort of a little experimental still because it really depends on the manifest or JSON being a certain way. And if that changes, you know, you have to you have to change things. So so only go down that route if you're if you're aware of that and if you keep that in mind. All right. Uh, part three, choose your own DAG stack part two. Um, testing with dbt and great expectations. Cool. So let's compare different approaches to testing. Um, I am not going to motivate why you should test your data um, that much. I have given a very long talk at uh, dbt coalesce actually last year where I gave a bunch of data horror stories. So hopefully at this point, um, you know, eight, eight months later, like people are more bought into why you should test your data, why you should have data validation in your in your pipelines, why you shouldn't just, um, you know, run, run all your data pipelines and just take everything for granted. Like I'm pretty sure you're aware of this at this point. Um, so I'm just going to present some options for how to do this. So first of all, we have uh, dbt and great expectations. Both have, so dbt has testing capabilities out of the box. Um, Great Expectations is a data validation testing package um, whose sole purpose is to uh, validate and document your data. So on the dbt side, like I said, test supported out of the box. You don't need any additional packages to install. You literally don't need to do very much other than adding um, some tests to your uh, to your schema.yaml where you're describing um, you know, each, each model. Um, the tests only operate on data and database. So just to recap, if you're not familiar with dbt, the really the main purpose of dbt is to transform data that is 
in a that is stored in a database or data warehouse um, and does all the transformation, does all the tests and runs all the SQL queries there. So, so this is kind of limited to your data as it is in the database. Um, DBT comes with certain built-in tests, like I said, things like non-null, for example, or um, certain values in columns. Um, and it also allows writing custom tests in SQL, which is really, really cool. So you can fairly easily uh, extend the expressivity of um, the DBT test with whatever it is that you want to write, basically. Um, great expectations. Again, like I said, it's, a, it's an open source Python packages, a package, so it does require while well, installing great expectations as a package. In addition to that, there's other dependencies in order for great expectations to run, right? So depending on what you're doing with your environment, um, that might be you know, a lot to install. Um, it requires additional uh, configuration. Um, on the other hand, once you've, once you've gone through that, um, the cool thing is you can really test any type of data asset. So you're not limited to just testing your stuff in a relational database. Um, you can test CSV files or Parquet files. You can test in-memory uh, data frames, for example. You can obviously test your data in any relational database. Um, and that means you have more opportunities to test um, your data before it even gets into your transformation pipeline, for example. And I, and I, and I honestly, I do think that's a um, huge uh, benefit and it's something that, you know, you might actually forget that if you get, for example, let's say third-party data deliverables as CSV files in an FTP server, that was kind of, um, you know, how, how I started uh, doing data integrations. Um, you might want to just test those CSV files before you even load them, right, to make sure that they actually match whatever it is that you expect from them. Um, you might then also use the exact same test to test whatever you have loaded to the database if you're doing a one-to-one -one load, for example, to make sure, you know, stuff didn't get truncated, for example, on the way to the database. Uh, my favorite thing is always special characters, like every time you load into a database, there's, um, there's chaos. Uh, so, so things like that um, really allow you to expand um, what you're testing and when you're testing. Um, Great Expectations also comes with some fairly complex built-in tests, which is really cool. So you can test things like distribution of values, for example, without having to write any custom uh, custom queries or anything. And you can also extend it with custom tests written in um, Python, which means you can technically import any Python package that you would like. Um, we've had people write custom tests, for example, to test for a specific language. Um, we have had people uh, writing codes to test whether something is a valid zip code in the US, um, valid phone numbers, email addresses, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I know there's a lot of, I'm not going to go into the SQL debate that's uh, currently raging on uh, uh, data Twitter, um, but I know there's a lot of people who are really into SQL and I totally um, support that. However, occasionally writing something in Python is just significantly um, faster and easier. So if you're willing to kind of step outside of that, um, Great Expectations uh, provides like, a, lot of, a lot of flexibility and a lot of expressivity there. Cool. Um, again, lots of text, lots of talking. So uh, I am going to show a few examples. Okay, so um, let's assume I have my um, uh, another Airflow DAG here. Um, and you can see I have uh, the pinkish notes here. I have one to load the source data. I have my, so this is sort of like DBT integration version one, which is I just have a single um, model, uh, sorry, a single task that runs the entire Airflow DAG. And then I have a published step, which might be pushing the data to some production databases, for example. Um, and in between, I have little uh, validation steps. So these are my great expectations validation steps. And I'm going to talk about a little bit what you can, where you can test with uh, great expectations and where you can test with um, uh, DBT tests. So um, first of all, uh, my validate source data step, I can use great expectations. So this little uh, icon here uh, is great expectations logo um, to test, for example, that the source data matches my expected format. So it has the correct number of columns, it has the correct data types. Um, the row count, for example, is similar. So, you know, within 
the range of last month's row count because that's what we expect. There's no crazy drops or we're just getting half of the data or, um, you know, the data deliverables accidentally uh, doubled in size. All things I have definitely experienced in my life uh, doing data integrations. Um, and you might have seen too, where all of a sudden it's like, oh, why does this data take so long to load? Oh, because for some reason, every single row is duplicated, right? Um, so this um, testing your source data, wherever it is, it could also be in another database, production database, whatever, um, is a very good first step to basically um, pull the brakes, notify someone, um, you know, ring all the alerts, send up that pager duty alert um, before you even start doing any loading or any transformation. So it, it'll hopefully just like save time um, and, and uh, sort of like, uh, you know, allow you to, allows you to um, investigate any issues before you're doing other stuff. So that is uh, potentially step one is uh, test your source data. Um, test number two could be um, once you've loaded your source data um, to test your, that your source data load was successful. So for example, you could test that no rows were lost compared to source, no columns were butchered, no um, data types were incorrectly changed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing that I actually did was I used the exact same expectation suite. So the cool thing with great expectation is but you can your expectation suite is completely independent from the data, which means you can just apply the same test to any data asset that you want to throw it at. So um, I actually frequently just use the same um, uh, the same expectation suite to test the source data and to test the loaded data, which is kind of cool that you can just reuse it in that in that way. Um, and and I think we're all aware of you know any of the load issues that happen um, occasionally. Cool. Um, so once you've uh, run your DBT DAC, there are, um, oh, actually, sorry, there's one more step. So one really cool way of using DBT tests um, for me personally is um, running DBT tests during DAC development um, to check for the inte integrity specifically of the transformation. So um, this might sound, and, and maybe I'm going a little esoteric here, uh, or maybe a lot of people agree with me, I don't actually know, um, but to me there are uh, two aspects to any like data pipeline, and it's really like the data, right, and then there's the code that transforms the data, and you kind of want to check things independently. So presumably when you're developing your SQL models and when you're writing um, uh, queries in uh, dbt, presumably you're running tests and looking at the output to make sure whatever it is that you're writing uh, is actually correct, right? Um, and that means usually you're doing this on fixed a fixed data set, hopefully, um, so you don't go completely crazy when everything changes all the time, right? Um, and that's a really good way to, to write dbt tests to um, establish certain assertions such as, okay, this should be, uh, you know, these these um, identifiers, for example, should be unique. This column should be non-null. Um, this is like the, the uh, range of values that I expect in this column, things like that, um, that allow you to really easily run those tests during um, development uh, while you're writing your models and check for integrity of transformations to make sure you're not actually like joining and causing a fan out or doing any uh, any weird things or accidentally causing null values and stuff like that. Um, so, so to me, that is a really cool um, and very simple and very easy way to write your tests as you're writing um, as you're writing your models, and you don't necessarily have to step outside of DBT to uh, you know use great expectations for that. Um, and then finally, um, in the final stage where you can uh, validate your you know whatever your uh, DBT transformation. Um, has done, you can validate your analytical output. So for example, again, testing integrity of transformations, no fan out joins, no null columns, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, in addition to that, also use um, uh, great expectations to use off the shelf methods for more complex tests, things like distributions of values, um, you know, anything that uh, might be slightly more involved and in particular, anything that you might want to communicate to your users, to your data consumers um, in the form of data docs, for example. So again, um, Great Expectations has these real cool uh, HTML outputs, HTML docs um, that you can use for, you know, to basically 
basically alert maybe your uh, your users and say, oops, there's something wrong with the data, and they can directly go to data docs and see what's actually going on. Um, so these are different uh, different approaches to uh, testing with um, great expectations versus DBT. Again, it really depends on your, I, 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 I'm again, not particularly opinionated here. It really depends on your application, on your use case. It depends on the ecosystem that you're using. Um, for example, if you're running uh, DBT cloud, like you, you, you know, if, if that's all you do um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to run your, uh, to execute your DBT transformations, for example, you might not want to step outside of that. Um, so there's different, um, you know, different trade-offs. One uh, thing that I actually did not mention here, um, there is a package that call, that's called DBT Expectations, um, which is sort of, um, I would call it a backport, I guess, or a version of um, the expressity of great expectations with the same naming conventions, roughly. Um, it to be used, basically written in SQL, so it can be used in um, DBT, uh, in DBT tests. Um, so I think that um, is also an option if you want to basically stay within the, the DBT ecosystem. Um, there is no direct connection between great expectations and DBT expectations. Uh, there's definitely been some collaboration, but there's no necessarily no guarantee that uh, whatever um, expectation uh, exists, for example, expect column values to be between actually corresponds exactly to the same um, type of test in DBT expectations. So just keep that in mind. There, there There's no one-to-one -one match necessarily between the two. Um, DBT expectations is more like inspired by great expectations and, and, and uh, borrow some of the terminology. Um, also happy to talk about that more in Q&A or in the, uh, in the Slack chat later. Um, awesome. So just to recap, um, I'm going to wrap up here and we have a little bit of time for, uh, for Q and A. So, uh, just to recap, um, choose your own DAG stack based on your needs, right. And based on your application, um, you can consider different DBT integration models and trade-offs. Keep that in mind, like keep in mind all the, the complexity, um, versus sort of the fine grained control. Um, take advantage of DBT and great expectations for testing at different points in the pipeline. Again, really depends on what you want to do, but there is definitely value in, you know, adding, going a little bit more complex for the sake of having more fine-grained control or having more uh, complex expressivity for your, um, for your expectations. And if there's something you want, like uh, data docs, for example, for, um, you know, that there, there's probably some value in it for you. Um, and finally, like I said, uh, sample projects. So both the um, uh, this version um, that has all the tests in there, as well as the sort of slightly simpler version um, uh, is um, of the different DBT integration models. Um, I've linked to both of them in uh, on my GitHub page, and, and again, I can I can just share that in the in the chat. Um, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, ping me on Twitter at SPBail. Ping me in the Airflow Slack. I'm there.